My name is Juliana, and I'm an environmental science student, and I interned with the National Phonology Network, or NPN, this year through the NASA Space Grant Program, and I've done all my research with the Nature's Notebook data. Today I'm going to go through how I started exploring and analyzing the phonology observations from Nature's Notebook, which hopefully will help other people who are interested in using this awesome tool. The bottom line is we're facing unprecedented global changes, and we need global monitoring to match these changes. For a long time, the scientific community has studied localized problems, but environmental problems are becoming increasingly more global. That said, scientists can't be everywhere at once, and this is where citizen science comes in. Changes in the phonology, or life cycle patterns, of organisms is one of the most traceable effects of global problems like climate change. And if everybody took 10 minutes out of their day and wrote down what was happening to the plant or animal in their backyard, we would have a global monitoring network to tell scientists how the world around us is changing and may continue changing in the future. And this is really how the Nature's Notebook data is being used. Scientists have already found advances in the start of spring, as well as species mismatches, which is where changing phonologies in two species make them newly incompatible. For example, if a flower starts blooming earlier, but a pollinator starts pollinating later in the season, and they no longer interact for as long, this can have repercussions within the ecosystem. We've already found that the effects of a changing climate impact different regions of the U.S. differently. What happens to trees in the Northeast is markedly different than what may happen to trees in the Sonoran Desert. Yet, arid land phonology is surprisingly understudied. We really don't have a good idea how, of how changing precipitation and temperature patterns will affect the southwest, which is why we need more phonology observations and research. On my first day working with the NPN, my mentor showed me how to download the Nature's Notebook data and told me to go forth and explore it, but I had no idea what to do. There were so many columns and factors that it took me a full semester to really orient myself and create a process for analyzing the data. The first step was understanding the data strengths and recognizing when to use which data set. The top strip on this slide is the summarized data, which means each line is an activity period. For example, a line could be from when an observer said a cactus was blooming to when he or she said it was no longer blooming. So it would give you the number of days it was assumed to be blooming, as well as the first date the observer noticed it blooming. So the summarized data makes it easy to look at things like duration, as well as onset, or the first day the cactus was blooming. This can be important if you're looking at the start of a season like spring, or how long pollen may be available in an ecosystem. The raw data, on the other hand, is shown at the bottom of the screen. Each row in the raw data represents a single observation, with one values meaning the phenophase was displayed, and zero values meaning the phenophase was not displayed. When observer observes that an organism such as a grass is not fruiting, Nature's Notebook records that as a zero. This format makes it easier to tell the frequency of observations taken by observers for a species and to calculate the total number of observations. In a way, raw data gives us fuller activity period data because it's easier to tell when there are a lot of negative observations versus just no observations at all. Even after delineating the strengths of the summarized and raw data, there are still many ways to look at the same spreadsheet. I created my own process that worked for me. First, I tried to figure out how much data there is, where it was taken, if it's consistent throughout the year, and which phenophases have sufficient observations. This part made it easier with the phonology visualization tools under the Get Data tab of the NPN's website. By click it, clicking on the U.S. map and selecting a species and phenophase, I was able to see the geographic distribution of sites as well as the total number of observations for different species, which is shown on the map on the right. Once I found a region and species that I was interested in, the visualization tool also lets you see how observations are grouped throughout the year, which you can see on the colorful calendar, where each gray line is a negative observation and each colored line is a positive observation. Another way to represent this data is with an activity graph. Using the raw data for a particular species and phenophase, in this case the Ocotillo plant and the phenophase flowers or flower buds, I graphed the Ocotillo observations in 2014. In Excel, I counted the number of yes observations for a given 15 day window, which is shown by the orange shading, and I counted the number of no observations during that same window, which are shown in gray. In this kind of graph, the total bar height represents the total number of observations taken during that time, 
and the coloring lets the viewer see how many of those observations noted that their ocotillo was flowering and how many of those observations noted that those, their ocotillo wasn't flowering. But there is a caveat here. Just looking at the positive observations, one might think that the ocotillo doesn't flower during the summer months. But in reality, the total, total bar heights during these months are small, meaning that there were just fewer observations during that period. Many of the Tucson observers are student groups and teachers who leave for summer vacation, skewing the data for that period. This highlights the importance of consistent observations throughout the year, but also the importance of checking to see what the data is really telling you. And these activity graphs are one way to do that. Generally, an important first step with using the Nature's Notebook data is to characterize the observations. For my project, I studied saguaro cacti and the invasive buffalo grass fruiting and flowering in Tucson from 2009 to 2014. So the first step was to see how many individuals were being observed and how many sites there were throughout that time frame. I was also curious about onset in Sonoran Desert plants, which is the first day the plant starts to fruit or flower. So I used the summarized data to look at the first day of year that they were observed to be fruiting or flowering. Something I learned quickly, however, was that it's important to look at the column that says number of days since prior no. Since I was looking for the earliest date a saguaro started fruiting, I wanted to make sure the dates recorded were as close to that as possible, not just someone who noticed a saguaro was fruiting after it had already been doing so for a month. So I excluded all observations that didn't have a prior negative observation within two weeks. That meant that the saguaro hadn't been fruiting two weeks before the recorded date. So the actual first date of fruiting had to lie somewhere within those 14 days, even if it wasn't on the exact date recorded. As you can tell by the top left graph, that usually means excluding a lot of observations, but it's an important way to control for quality. Once I got a handle on the Nature's Notebook data, I decided to compare with climatic data to see how saguaros and buffalo grass might be responding to climatic triggers, like precipitation and temperature. Since the Nature's Notebook data includes GPS coordinates, I was able to plug those into the Daymet single pixel extraction tool online, which approximates temperature and precipitation across the U.S. Next, I overlaid the precipitation data from Daymet with an activity graph for buffalo grass flowering similar to the one before for Ocotillos. The bar height still represents the total number of observations in Tucson, and the red portion represents the number of those that noted that the buffalo grass was flowering, so a positive observation. And the black line represents the precipitation at the site in millimeters from Damon. I found that in 2014, buffalo grass flowering activity followed precipitation events with within 15 to 30 days, suggesting that buffalo grass phenology may be related to precipitation. I spent the first half of my internship conducting a phenology model literature review and characterizing the Arizona Nature's Notebook data, and the second half of my internship studying the iconic saguaro cactus, which is shown on the left, and the invasive buffalo grass shown on the right. I chose these plants because they have a wealth of observations in the NPN database and because of their local significance. Saguaros are a keystone species in the Sonoran Desert and hold cultural significance for Native Americans, whereas buffalo grass have been shown to be detrimental to the local environment, where they compete with native plants and increase the risk of wildfires. I compared the onset date of species fruiting and flowering with the seasonal temperature variables provided in the Nature's Notebook data across years, with temperature along the x-axis and the first onset day along the y-axis. The graph on the left shows that data by individuals, where each point marks an individual's first day flowering, and the graph on the right shows the data summarized by site, where each site had an onset day, averaged from all the individuals at that site. This was one of the tightest relationships I found, where both flowering and fruiting and buffalo grass were earlier with warmer spring and winter temperatures, suggesting that warmer temperatures may advance flowering and fruiting onset for buffalo grass. This is important implications for land managers, who are interested in when to remove buffalo grass before it reproduces. On the other hand, the relationship between buffalo grass and precipitation was weaker, and I found almost no statistically significant relationships for the saguaro, which may be because saguaros act on a longer time scale than what I studied. I also looked at the amount of precipitation in the 30 days before the onset of flowering and fruiting, compared to the average 30-day precipitation for that year. As you can tell from the graph below, 
In the spring, flowering in saguaros happened after periods of less than average rainfall, suggesting saguaro flowering may be triggered by drought conditions. But in the fall, buffalo grass flowering is preceded by above average precipitation, suggesting that they may be triggered by rainfall events. These same patterns held true for the fruiting phenophases and give us some insight into how these organisms may react to changes in climate. So, in summary, Nature's Notebook is an amazing free resource and it runs on awesome observers like you. So thank you. These observations are truly helping the scientific community understand what is happening to our ecosystems over time. And the other takeaway is that you should use the data for your own projects. There are many ways to look at the Nature's Notebook data and there are simple analysis techniques you can do with just Excel and basic statistics, along with some basic quality control measures. I explained one way to look at the data, but there are way more out there. So go ahead and ask questions.